have spent more than two billion dollars on the greatest scientific gamble in history. And we have won. On the 15th of August, 1945, the Japanese Emperor Hirohito went on national radio. It was the first time a Japanese Emperor had spoken on radio to his people. He told them, Japan has surrendered to the Allied forces. Australia's Prime Minister, John Curtin, was robbed of the opportunity to share in the total Allied victory. A victory which he had worked so hard to achieve and which had tragically robbed him of his life's strength. John Curtin, the pacifist who had fought conscription in the First World War, became total in his commitment to the Allied cause and victory. To his friends and enemies, the boy from Creswick became known as Hellfire Jack. Henry Creswick and his two brothers, John and Charles, settled on a site now known as Creswick. Little did they realize that this delightful area with its clear crystal streams and densely timbered picturesque valleys would become one of the top 12 towns of the colony of Victoria. Creswick would also be the birthplace of leaders in all walks of life. In just 10 years, the discovery of gold on the Ballarat gold fields would transform the whole district. To the original pastoralists, th this was a wonderful country. The seven hills, the old volcanic cones that had been worn down into smooth, rounded shapes. Uh, very good rainfall, marvelously rich pasture. The uh, coming of that other element in Victorian society. I mean, Victorian, Victoria had two separate foundations. One was that great pastoral foundation for 15 or 16 years, and then suddenly the interloping gold that uh, destroyed so much of the pastoral peace as the pastoralists like to think of it. They, of course, had destroyed the Aboriginal peace before that. By 1858, the population of the colony of Victoria soared from 100,000 to half a million people. Towards the end of the 1870s, Creswick was like any other town on the rich gold fields of the world. 18 kilometers from Ballarat, Creswick had grown to a sizable town of the period. Those who migrated from the four corners of the globe had high hopes of making a fortune from their gold mining claims. Others were satisfied making a good living by working for the big gold mining companies. Early in 1877, a labourer from County Cork, Ireland, arrived in the colony of Victoria. His name was John Curtin. He was 23 years of age. John Curtin joined the Victorian artillery as a gunner. On the 10th day of July, 1878, he transferred from the artillery to the Victoria Police Force as a constable. And after several Melbourne postings, one of which was as a warder at Pentridge Prison, Constable Curtin applied to be transferred from Russell Street Police Station to Creswick. He was posted to Creswick in July of 1881, and he remained there on and off until 1882, his only postings being nearby to Melbourne, Ballarat and Allendale. He returned to Creswick and remained there until his discharge through ill health on the 31st of January, 1890. The Curtin family couldn't have been very well off, but by the same, at the same time, they weren't really poor. If you look at the house that they lived in, you see that it has a nice solid tiled roof, and um, they certainly don't look poor in their clothing. Constable Curtin had a steady public service position with a regular salary. If there was any poverty in the family, it would have occurred after he had to be superannuated from the police force because of ill health. 
Constable Curtin served 12 years in the Victorian police force, almost nine of them at Creswick. By December of 1882, Constable Curtin had become a well-respected police officer of the district. However, on the 12th of that month, he was going to need all the skills he had learned as a police officer to deal with the greatest gold mining disaster ever. The new Australasian mine was to claim the lives of 22 men. It was thought that they were well away from the water and that there was no problem. And for quite a long while before the breakthrough took place, there had been a fair quantity of water being brought up from the mine further on uh, down the drive, and they were thinking that that water was gradually draining the water that had banked up in the old Australasia number one. So that when the burst took place, they were quite uh, unprepared for it. Frantic efforts were made then to stem the flow of water, or uh, not to, so much to stem the flow, but to raise the water out, out of the mine. Uh, the pumps were put on uh, full strength. Uh, Word was sent immediately to the mine manager. The, actually, the, this took place at 5.30 in the morning and they woke the mine manager up out of his sleep and uh, brought him, that was Mr Nicholas, uh, and uh, he came to the mine and made arrangements for the pumps to be augmented by, uh, by bailers. And later on, as it became known how, just how serious the position was, uh, the number of people at the mine had numbered thousands. It was thought that the men would have made for the number nine jump up, which they thought at that time was the most commodious of, of, the, of, of the channels that were available to the men. But uh, when they got there, there was nobody there. And then actually they find, found them in number 11. Unfortunately, they all went to the one jump up. Now, if they'd separated, congregated, instead of congregating together, if they'd separated and gone into a different uh, jump ups or, uh, they could have perhaps been, they, more of them could have perhaps been saved because one of the biggest problems was the lack of air. Constable Curtin worked tirelessly throughout the day and night trying to save trapped miners. The superintendent in charge of the Ballarat district Superintendent Henry S. Palmer commanded Constable Curtin for his work during the mine disaster. Next year, Constable Curtin married Kate Agnes Burke, also a native of County Cork. Seventeen months later, they had a son, John Joseph Ambrose. He was born on the 8th of January, 1885, and was baptised at St. Augustine's Roman Catholic Church in Criswick. The son of Constable John Curtin was destined to become an international statesman, a man who would play a never-to-be-forgotten role in the destiny of his nation. This is the baptistry at which John Curtin was baptised. John Curtin's baptism is uh, uh, registered. He was born on January the 8th, baptised on the 17th of February, uh, his um, parents, his name is John. His parents are John Curtin and Catherine Burke, address Creswick, and the, his, the witnesses were John Joseph Kissane and Helena Doyle. And the baptising priest was Father Michael Mead, who came to Creswick as the, in the same, in the, year John was born. Historically interesting also at the time was the doctor who delivered John Curtin Jr., Dr. Robert C. Lindsay. Lindsay had 10 children, most of whom were also to carve for themselves international reputations in the world of art, music, and literature. They were regular churchgoers, but this did not stop the anti-Chinese actions of the Lindsay boys. During mealtimes, they would run through the Chinese camps, overturning the Chinese cooking walks, and then head for home, pretending nothing had happened. Constable Curtin often had to make more than the occasional duty call on Dr. and Mrs. Lindsay about the pranks of their children in the Chinese quarter. The Lindsays had a firm affection toward Constable Curtin and his family. Norman Lindsay was to give young John Curtin his first job, a job that would play a big part 
in shaping his destiny. Sadness and misfortune struck the Curtin family, as Constable Curtin fought hard to throw off continual bouts of rheumatic fever. When he was discharged on the 31st of January, 1890, his immediate senior officer, Sergeant H.N. Chomley, said of him, Constable Curtin's conduct has been very good. Constable Curtin had been in Creswick for some eight years at the time of his retirement and presumably had earned himself quite a reputation among the, the local gentlemen. On the evening of February 7, they gathered at the American Hotel with plans to, to collect money for a testimonial to Constable Curtin. The actual presentation took place on Monday, February 24, and there's a report of this in the Advertiser of Wednesday, February the 26th, 1890. Being a police constable was probably the best job John Curtin Sr. ever had. After being discharged from the police force, ex-constable Curtin worked intermittently, sometimes at various country hotels as manager, at other times at whatever he could obtain. They must have been periods of considerable poverty. This was reflected in the poor type of rented accommodation the Curtin family obtained. It also affected the Curtin children's education. Young John had been to seven different country schools, and he finally left school at 13 years of age. When the Curtins moved to Brunswick, they lived at six different addresses. John Curtin Sr. again worked at whatever he could find. One job was supposed to have been as a spruker for a local cinema next to the Retreat Hotel in Brunswick's Sydney Road. The legendary world champion boxer, Jack Johnson, is believed to walk past the theatre on one occasion. He sighted the, the man outside, uh, outside the uh, theatre, spooking. Commissioner, you know, dolled up. You all heard a man outside, the oyster, you copied him. He was all dolled up and he went out and he saw it was a white man. And he was that sad, happy about it. Uh, he shook hands and he said, Congratulations, sir. In my country, only niggers do that job. Kate Curtin spent a period as licensee of the True Britain Hotel and at the Phoenix in Brunswick. And it was during these periods at the hotels that young John Curtin began to develop a taste for alcohol, a problem that was to haunt him for much of his life. Having the hotel had a, had a lot to do with the with him drinking. Towards the end of the 19th century, the Ballarat goldfields had become a spawning ground for idealism and every shade of political activism in the young emerging nation of Australia. I would think that um, the Creswick environment is one of the most uh, remarkable in Australian history, in the fact that nurtured in that small community, you had people such as the Lindsays, uh, W.G. Spence developed a whole philosophy of unionism that was exported to the rest of Australia. And you get a, a sense that great rivers of ideas, as well as gold, were running through this country in the minds of the people who inhabited it. When John Curtin was born, a nine-year-old James Scullin of Trawalla was beginning to show signs of being a student with a very bright future. James Scullin was also to have an important influence on the life of young John Curtin. Both were destined to become Prime Ministers of Australia. Curtin had become an avid reader. In his spare time, he would walk several kilometres from Brunswick to the Melbourne Library and newspaper offices to read and learn of the world around him. Australians were kept informed of what was happening in the Boer War by a brilliant Australian journalist of the time. Banjo Patterson. His stories and graphic descriptions of the war were being more than favorably compared with those of British journalists Winston Churchill and Rudyard Kipling. Destiny and future world events were to bring the brilliant Churchill and Australia into closer contact and conflict. By 1900, he had been working for nearly two years his job being that of a printer's devil for an old family friend from the Creswick days, Norman Lindsay. It's interesting that John Curtin got his start in journalism, or in printing anyway, from Norman Lindsay. And one can see that uh, small town 
association in Curtin's youth being important in getting him the job. You can sense, I think, that uh, Lindsay recognised that here was someone from Queswick who deserved a chance and was prepared to give him, it, give him it just because of that association. For a time, he is also believed to work for David Syme and The Age as a copy boy. Young John Curtin joined the Socialist Party of Victoria. He also played football and cricket for Brunswick. John Curtin played here in 1906. He was a, uh, I understand, a back pocket player, if uh, people know what that means. But uh, he, uh, he apparently was not any great footballer. Obviously, he, he, he didn't... Uh, train because he didn't last long and when they went up to up to Brunswick in 1908 he uh, he never played up there he became a committee man but uh, and this ground is very uh, uh, very uh, close to the Sarah Sands Hotel so uh, 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 it used to be he, he wasn't the only player probably we used to go up sit to get in a rub down at half time and go and have a pot a man who was beginning to have an influence on Curtin was Frank Anstey, who was also a socialist. Anstey was president of the Brunswick Football Club, so this probably influenced Curtin to play with the club. He was a fiery speaker and voluminous pamphlet publisher. In 1902, Anstey was elected to the Victorian seat of East Burke in the Legislative Assembly. He remained an MLA for eight years. By 1904, the new Australian Federation saw the first ever Labour government in the world come to power under John Christian Watson. It was to last only from April the 27th to August the 17th. However, a political milestone had been created. The Labour movement could provide an alternative government to the free traders and protectionists. Frank Anstey was elected the federal member for Burke, which covered the areas of Essendon, Northcote, and Brunswick. He was around Stewart Street, just around the corner. Houses that are uh, seemingly still there, but they have they haven't been used for one while. And uh, he lived there until he, oh, I think he, he saved enough, enough money out of his salary to be able to build this place. But he built this himself and owned it himself. By 1907, John Curtin was 27 years of age and had become president of the Brunswick branch of the Political Labour League. He continued to be an active member of the Victorian Socialist Party. One of his most important um, events was when he went to hear Frank Anstey speak when Anstey was standing for Parliament. And this um, young man stood up in the, um, in the audience and I think moved a vote of thanks to uh, Anstey. And that was the beginning of another association which was all part of the Brunswick environment. You can um, judge that the family had uh, financial difficulties when you uh, follow one house to another and see that the, the houses were really um, an aspect of their struggle against uh, poverty. It became a place of cheap rents and this was one of them. And, uh, uh, thus uh, attracted people who were uh, from other towns and other suburbs and uh, uh, this, is, this was actually the second house which John Curtin Sr. lived uh, in. The first one was around in Grey Street but uh, this was the, he only was there for a while, they, they moved about. That's because the events were cheap and it was easy to get houses in Brunswick then. Curtin was busy speaking at the Yarra Bank on public meetings with his mentor, Frank Anstey, whenever the opportunities arose. Things were starting to go well for Curtin. At the beginning of 1911, he was appointed State Secretary of the Timber Workers' Union. It was, however, a period in which he decided to leave the Roman Catholic Church. He may have been influenced by Frank Anstey, who had a dislike for institutions particularly the Church of Rome. Anstey was a great orator, and no doubt Curtin studied his vivid style of electioneering. We used to call, uh, my parents and that, used, used to call Jack Curtin Hellfire Jack. He was a very uh, uh, strong speaker, 
and he had a, he, he had he, he had that that uh, uh, peculiar habit that he he is shown to him on the later pictures that, that he used to uh, have a, a stagey pose. You know, it's like you know, go from foot to other, do it right, and according to the stagecraft. But in when he was in Brunswick, he used to. Uh, have the habit of scratching under his arm, and everyone used to say he was lousy. Well, he probably was, because we were all lousy in Brunswick in those days. Fleas were, fleas was the most, there were more fleas per square inch than there were people in Brunswick. Labour lost the federal election of 1913, but kept control of the Senate. James Scullin lost his country seat of Corangamite. However, Joseph Cook's liberals were to remain in power only 15 months. They held office with a one-seat majority. On the 5th of September, 1914, Fisher was back again in control as Prime Minister. John Curtin stood as a candidate for Balaclava against Willie Watt, the former Premier of Victoria. He polled 12,526 votes. Watt polled 17,607. By this time, Curtin began to drink heavily. The problem threatened to overwhelm him at only 29 years of age. His acute alcoholism was giving him a reputation worse than that of the local town drunk. Fisher had won back government with the promise to commit his party to support Britain in the impending war, to the last man and the last shilling. By 1915, Fisher was experiencing poor health he was worried about the war and the demands by England for more manpower. Britain had not even advised Fisher of the Gallipoli landings until after the invasion. His deputy, Billy Hughes, wanted Fisher's job, and he got it. Fisher was sent off to England as Australia's High Commissioner. The conscription issue was now really on. On the 28th of October, 1916, a referendum was put to the people for conscription. It lost by only 72,000 votes. The issue fragmented the Labour Party. John Curtin threw himself into the anti-conscription campaign and was appointed an organiser of the National Trade Union Congress against conscription. Within two weeks of the conscription referendum being defeated, Prime Minister Hughes walked out of the Labour Party, taking with him 23 of his supporters and formed a national party with the opposition. Curtin found the conscription issue extremely traumatic. He had been drinking heavily, often with the hard drinkers of the trades hall. His health began to deteriorate and he had to be admitted to the Lara Hospital for alcoholism. Oh, I think he knew uh, deeply that he was making a mistake. See, he never seemed to me to enjoy drinking. He was an unhappy drinker. Uh, he didn't drink for companionship, and yet um, the drinking was something that um, seemed to give him a, a, a ease of manner with people, and that wasn't easy for Curtin, except a few that he d was devoted to very much. When he came out of Lara, a uh, recommendation was that he should break his environment. That was a special place they picked out, keep away from the Wigan Hotel. John Curtin had applied for the job as editor of the West Australian Worker. It's doubtful that he would have been given the job ahead of other applicants had Frank Anstey not supported his application. And Anstey went to Perth, uh, unknown to most people, for this purpose to talk with the um, leading men who were also standing for the um, job as editor of the um, worker. 1917 commenced well for Curtin. He had a new and prestigious job in Perth, and on April the 21st, 1917, he married Elsie Needham. It had been a long courtship. The Needhams didn't seem to approve of their daughter's marriage to Curtin. Their opposition stemmed mainly from Curtin's drinking problems and possibly that he had been a Catholic. The Curtins married privately at the marriage registrar's home in West Perth. A second conscription referendum was put to the Australian people in December of 1917. This was even more decisively lost. 
In this campaign, the Irish Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne, Daniel Mannix, became one of the biggest supporters of anti-inscription. Curtin led the campaign in West Australia. Ironically, however, West Australia voted overwhelmingly yes for conscription. Labour split on the issue in the West, but Curtin could claim that the no vote had been increased in that state by 94,000 over the previous referendum. Curtin was one of those who, when the uh, referenda went against uh, the anti-conscriptionists, uh, who said, in effect, well, that's that. Now, it's our job to restore uh, party unity. Not long after this, the Curtin's first child, a daughter, Elsie, was born. John Curtin's mother, Kate Curtin, came across to Perth to stay with the newlyweds and see her new granddaughter. Elsie says that years later, she was told her grandmother had taken her one day to the Cottesloe Catholic Church and had her secretly baptized. John Curtin and his father seemed to have grown apart. Frank Anstey had become a father figure to Curtin. On the 25th of March, 1919, John Curtin Sr. died at 143 Brunswick Road, Brunswick. Curtin was finding Western Australia satisfying and rewarding. When Curtin came to Western Australia uh, as uh, editor of the West Australian Worker, uh, he didn't drop his ties uh, with uh, Eastern Australia and, uh, by consequence, the influence of men like Anstey continued to uh, uh, persist upon him. A wharf union's demarcation dispute had developed in the port of Fremantle. And by May the 4th, 1919, the situation had worsened. A ship came in and the union lumpers, before they would load it, wanted it to be cleared by quarantine. The Premier, Colbatch, decided to come down in a um, motor launch to see what was going on. I think he quite rightly assumed that he would not be a target. But somehow or other, the rumour got round that scab labour was being brought down the river because of the picketing that there was on the land. And so as the boat went under the um, traffic bridge, it had things dropped on it. And then when it went under the uh, railway bridge, it had much bigger things dropped on it. And uh, uh, this endangered the life of the Premier. I think this added to the, though he wasn't hurt, I think this added to the tension. And then the police were moved in. And the police had fixed bayonets. Some men were bayoneted and Tom Edwards was actually killed. A meeting on the issue was held in Perth. John Curtin was one of the main speakers among many prominent West Australian Labour men. During the meeting, a messenger rushed in to announce that a striker had died because of police brutality on the wharves. John Curtin wrote an editorial note to his report in the West Australian Worker on the incident. He wrote, no matter how much the government may compensate the family of Tom Edwards, Labour must not fail. His funeral was a tremendous occasion. It's supposed still to be the biggest thing that's ever happened in Fremantle, the biggest procession. The whole city stopped. I don't think that the state government had wanted it to go as far as this. It had got out of hand. Curtin had not given up drinking. There were still outbreaks that worried his family and friends. All through her life, Elsie Curtin never forgot her strong Methodist upbringing. Her daughter, Elsie McLeod, says her mother never allowed any alcohol in the home. There were occasions she remembers when her father would come home late, the worse for drink. The Curtin children would be shielded from this. If arguments and altercations took place, it happened in private. Elsie McLeod recalls an occasion when the family was traveling by train across the Nullarbor during Curtin's first period in Canberra as the federal member for Fremantle. Her father left the carriage they were traveling in, walked down the corridor, took a breast flask from his coat pocket and drank some of its contents. His daughter witnessed the incident and reported it to her mother. 
John Curtin returned to the carriage and commenced to read. But after a time, his wife leaned across her husband, put her hand inside his breast pocket, extracted the flask, and threw it out the train window. Nothing was said. Abram Needham was only to enjoy his grandchildren and living with the Curtins for three years. He died in 1922, aged 62. John Curtin stood as a Labour candidate on two occasions during his period as editor of the West Australian Worker. In 1919, he stood for the seat of Perth, and in 1925, for Fremantle. He lost on both occasions. Curtin became the president of the West Australian chapter of the Australian Journalist Association for five years from 1920 to 1925. What he wanted to do was to raise the standard, the intellectual quality uh, of journalism uh, in uh, 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 Western Australia. And out of this association with Curtin, God help him, help him having to, to come weekly for a couple of months and listen uh, uh, to the outpourings of this relatively uninformed youngster, but that's what I was. By 1927, Curtin had become quite an influential figure in the labour movement in West Australia. He was asked to join a royal commission inquiring into child endowment. It was a Bruce Page commission. The decision to invite Curtin indicates even the conservative side of politics respected the kind of contribution Curtin could make. The commission met in all states. This meant it took Curtin away from his home and family. And in an attempt to assuage his enforced loneliness, he again sought refuge in drink. 1928 saw the first indications of an impending depression. John Curtin stood for the federal seat of Fremantle. He won it, and it was the first time Labour had been successful in the seat for 15 years. Curtin was to join his old friend and mentor from the Brunswick days, Frank Anstey. It would be a testing time, but Curtin would have the forum at last to try his theories and work at fulfilling his life ambitions, even if initially as a member of the opposition. I had a close relationship with Curtin from the time he first entered Parliament in 1928 until he finally died in office as Prime Minister in 1945. In those early days, of course, there was no regular train travel, so many uh, uh, parliamentarians from the distant states, and in particular from Western Australia, used to spend their weekends in Canberra. And this home and this garden were places where Parliamentarians of all parties were welcome, amongst them, of course, John Curtin. The Bruce Page government collapsed in September 1929, and an election was set down for the 12th of October. James Scullin, the boy from the Ballarat Goldfields, gained 15 new seats for Labour, giving them the largest majority ever since Federation. However, Labour had only seven seats in the Senate out of 36. Prime Minister Stanley Melbourne Bruce lost his seat, and John Curtin again won Fremantle, this time comfortably. It collapses for all sorts of reasons. I suppose the immediate reason is the attack by Bruce on the arbitration system. Bruce's decision that there was, in, uh, there was industrial anarchy in Australia, there was timber strikes, timber worker strikes, seamen strikes, and so on. The only answer to this was to hand back arbitration from the Commonwealth to the states. Now, as soon as he made that decision, of course, Billy Hughes, who's been looking for an opportunity for years to bring Bruce down, he swings to being anti-Bruce. But it also, of course, it brings up a great groundswell for Labour because the arbitration system was held to be the great bulwark of protecting a minimum standard of living in Australia. The Depression was now being felt very seriously in Australia. Export prices had completely collapsed. Overseas borrowing ceased, causing a dramatic fall in the Australian income. There were expectations in West Australia, and no doubt Curtin had similar views, that he would make the new Scullin cabinet. This was not to happen. It wasn't Scullin's decision, by the way, of course. It's an election of members of caucus who are in the ministry. And when that happens, you have lots of bargains between New South Wales and Victoria, 
between the moderates in the party, the conservatives in the party, the opportunists and so on. And he missed out on that after all he was Western Australian. That was probably a disadvantage for him. But it's said that the main reason for it was that when he was elected again, in, uh, elected, I'm sorry, the first time in 1928, that that he was entrusted by the leader of the party, Mr Scullin, with a most important speech in the Commonwealth Parliament on, uh, on industrial arbitration, and that when it came for Mr Curtin to speak, that his old infirmity had struck him, and he wasn't able to speak. Missing out on Cabinet in the ill-fated Scullin government was nearly the finish of Curtin. He felt frustrated. He was far from home, away from his family. His wife believed her place was at home in Cottonslow, looking after their two children and her mother. She would not go to Canberra. John Curtin again turned to drinking. Undoubtedly, it was his despondency which made him turn to drink for solace. He was, of course, a great family man, and he, he missed his family. And that made him lonely. He was despondent, basically, because of his concern about the state of public affairs. He felt, I'm sure, that he should have been included in Curtin's, in um, Scullin's cabinet, which was uh, conserve, concerned with the gravest of social and economic problems of the Depression. Curtin, of course, was in many ways a modest man but he was conscious and continuously aware of the fact that he'd devoted his half a lifetime to the, to the Labour Party and had examined the policies and practice of the Labour Party and felt that he had some of the answers to the, 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 the questions that were before the government. Curtin, I would have said, probably began drinking with purely social objectives or objectives of exchanging ideas. I'd be inclined to state almost categorically that the journalist, journalist helped rather than hindered Curtin in this regard. I'd go on to say that uh, I recall quite clearly that it was a few members of the parliamentary staff and a few journalists, and only a few of his own party, by no means all, who uh, gave the warm support and the practical aid to Curtin that really helped him with this problem. His parliamentary colleagues could visualise only disaster if Curtin became a minister. He was losing credibility, and this seemed only to intensify his drinking. His close friends would often walk him around Canberra after dinner to try and straighten him out before the evening parliamentary sessions. Sometimes they just put him to bed. During the term of the Scullin government, Curtin did, however, become one of the main opponents of the New South Wales Premier, Jack Lang, who advocated reneging on his state's loan debts as a method of overcoming the financial crisis brought about by the Depression. I think he could see the case for Lang, I don't think he'd have had any sympathy with the dismissal of Lang by Sir Philip Game. Uh, but on the other hand, he would have had no sympathy with Lang's impatience and disruption of the Scullin government. I think, I think he wanted, what he was working for was a disciplined, unified Labour movement. Scullin was experiencing straight-out hostility and non-cooperation from the chairman of the Commonwealth Bank Board, Sir Robert Gibson. Sir Otto Niemeyer had been sent to Australia by the Bank of England to tell the government that during the Depression they must continue to pay the high rate of interest to Britain for the 1914-18 war debts and reduce wages and pensions. He comes out convinced that the economic future of Australia is being tied to British capital. Now I think there are two things wrong with this from the point of view of, of Australians. One was that if you're tied to British capital, then you're tied to the rise and fall of the British in the world. By 1930-odd, the British are on the way down. And all the 
discerning people in public life know the British are on the way down. The Scullin government was fragmenting for these reasons. And because of the considerable antagonism between two ministers, Joseph Lyons and Ted Theodore, Lyons resigned from his party and became leader of the Conservative forces. In November 1931, the Scullin government finally collapsed. John Curtin lost his seat of Fremantle in the election that followed. His party had fragmented and faced a mammoth reunification and rebuilding program. I think it was a very great shock that Curtin had lost the seat. And the general theory was it was the women because of the enormous charitable work. And I don't think Watson, who beat Curtin as an independent, was giving out food in the Depression to win the seat. He was doing this for a number of years. He was genuinely distressed at the appalling amount of distress that there was in Fremantle. Remember, there were no widows' pensions until 1943. And uh, private charitable uh, efforts were what uh, help widows and help the unemployed. Now Watson ran a magnificent business, Watson's bacons and hams and butter and, and he uh, saw to it, found out people in most distress and they'd wake up in the morning and find a big hamper on their front doorstep which was a gift from Watson. When he stood, um, because he, I don't think he thought in 1931 that the Scullin government had made much of a fist of the Depression, though it had not been able to get its policy through the Senate. Uh, I think he stood because uh, he was genuinely compassionate and I think he wanted to try to bring a compassionate policy in at the higher level in uh, Canberra. But he didn't stand in 1934 when Curtin won it back. Uh, because I don't think he thought that the uh, Conservatives had done much of a job and he went back into his private life. Losing his seat of Fremantle did not have the devastating effect on John Curtin many had anticipated. Curtin began to think out what should be the future policy of the Australian Labour Party. We must gradually show quite clearly that we're not just uh, a minor capitalist party we must show just exactly where we differ from these Conservatives. Now, Curtin, between 1931 and 1934, begins to think out that policy, which became the policy of an independent defence policy for Australia, that the defence of Australia was the coastline of Australia and not Europe or not Southeast Asia. That the, this is consistent with the Curtin of 1916. There must not be expeditionary forces. And secondly, and most important, that the aircraft has revolutionised the situation for warfare and that it's no longer possible, if it ever were possible, certainly no longer possible for Australia to be defended by the British Navy. When he was defeated, when he returned to Perth to meet his wife, to face his problems, to see the associates, associates who were worried a bit about his failure, that he almost immediately um, stopped drinking. When he's defeated in the landslide of 1931 uh, and is out of Parliament, then was the great opportunity for him to uh, reflect on his situation. And I think those years 31 to 34, he gets back again in 34, are uh, rather like the years 1916 to 1926 for Curtin, that they were great, they, they, were, they were very fruitful years for him. He ceased to be uh, um, an alcoholic in that period, uh, and he forced himself to find uh, things to do for bread and butter purposes, and some of the things that he uh, did were, uh, in that period, uh, highly significant. I would say also that the state government, in giving him uh, employment to uh, uh, sit on the uh, uh, State Grants Commission, uh, and he was a real student, he was a very high tribute paid to him by Reed, who was the Under Secretary of the Treasury, 
how uh, he mastered uh, the whole financial needs of Western Australia. I was never worried, and of course I've always been an eternal optimist, and I had no doubt that Curtin would overcome his difficulties and do something of the kind which, in fact, he ultimately did. By 1935, James Scullin would step down from the leadership of the Labour Party and Curtin would be asked to take his place. The condition was that he could signify he had mastered his drinking problem and that he would give up alcohol completely. Fremantle had been anything but a safe seat for Labour. As a seat, it was almost as volatile as the seaport itself. It was a physically fit John Curtin who went back to Canberra again as the member for Fremantle. The look of loneliness had left him. He went back to Canberra this time without the influence of Anstey and Theodore. Both had retired from Parliament. James Scullin was still federal parliamentary leader. He had made some gains since the disastrous election of 1931, but still presided over a fragmented and divided party. He was nearing the end of his leadership. Scullin decided to resign as leader of the Parliamentary Labour Party on the 1st of October, 1935. When Curtin was approached concerning the leadership of the party, he was genuinely surprised. Francis Michael Ford, the member from Queensland, had been deputy leader and was expected by most to become leader on Scullin's retirement. Curtin had even indicated to a close friend, Norman Makin, before he left to attend the coronation in England, that he did not consider he had the qualifications to lead the party. On this occasion, uh, uh, we walked along North Terrace, and uh, he said uh, to me in conversation, well, you know that Jim Scullin is uh, a very sick man, and uh, I'm afraid we will not be able to expect him to continue uh, in the position of leader very much longer. Uh, who do you see that there is available uh, to become the leader? Of course, uh, you and I, uh, we are not uh, of sufficient uh, competence to be able to undertake the position or something to that dis degree. However, Curtin was looked upon as someone who could reunite the party. But he still had one big question mark alongside him. Had he mastered his drinking? Prominent Victorian ALP member E.J. Holloway was designated to approach Curtin concerning the leadership. The first question Curtin was asked was, could he give up drinking if he was elected leader? I've often wondered about how far the prospect of leadership was what finally caused him to give up drinking. Curtin um, would, if necessary, have uh, given up drinking in order to qualify for the leadership. But it happens simultaneously, as I recall. Curtin beat Ford by one vote for the leadership. Curtin faced a mammoth rebuilding task of his party. He kept his promise never to drink again. He had to build Labour membership and the party's public image, and he also had to resolve the differences with the Lang Labour group and unify his party. It was to take Curtin to the beginning of 1939 to unite Labour and eventually wrench control of the New South Wales State Executive away from Lang Labour. John Curtin's return to federal parliament in 1934 coincided with the election for the first time of Robert Gordon Menzies. When Curtin became leader of his party in 1935, Menzies was to become deputy leader to Lyons and of his party. In the election of 1937, Joseph Lyons was prime minister, John Curtin was federal opposition leader, and war in Europe was looming. Curtin had been gaining stature not only in his own party for his efforts to unify it, but also among the electorate at large. During the 1937 election, fate, history and coincidence were to play interesting roles. John Curtin, as leader of the opposition, came back to Creswick for the first time on the evening of the federal election which was to be held on October 23, 1937. As it happened, Mr Lyons, who was Prime Minister at the time, was also in Creswick on the same night. Mr Lyons spoke 
at the town hall at eight o'clock and was then given a civic reception by the Shire President. It was arranged that Mr Curtin's meeting wouldn't take place until 9.30pm so that people would have the opportunity of first hearing Mr Lyons and then hearing the opposition. The editor and proprietor of the Creswick Advertiser was Doug Lindsay. The newspaper reported both speeches which took place almost simultaneously. Joseph Lyons won the 1937 election and Curtin continued to work hard to unify his party. Early in April of 1939, Joe Lyons died. He was the first Prime Minister to die while still in office. Country Party leader Dr Earl Page became acting Prime Minister. Menzies was then elected leader of the larger United Australia Party and became Prime Minister. On September the 3rd, 1939, Australia was at war alongside Britain and other members of the Empire. Prime Minister Menzies invited Curtin to form a national government with him. Curtin declined Menzies' offer on an all-party government and countered with an offer to join a war council in an advisory capacity. Curtin was in no doubt whatever uh, that he must not uh, prejudice uh, the unity and effectiveness of the Australian labour movement. Under no circumstances will we go into a, a, a national government that if there's to be any government, it must be a Labour government. The federal election for 1940 was set for the 21st of September. Labour was still divided in New South Wales and Curtin was to work very hard during the election to try to unify in that state. He was successful, but to his own personal detriment. Because of the immense amount of work needed in New South Wales and campaigning generally all over Australia, Curtin had neglected his own electorate. When the results were posted, Curtin looked as if he had lost his seat to Lee, the UAP candidate. This electorate of volatile voting patterns remained a cliffhanger for a week until Curtin finally won with the aid of soldiers' postal votes. His final majority was about 648. It would indeed have been uh, a very uh, uh, tragic uh, loss for Australia, and it would I have meant finish to any really significant uh, career on Curtin's path. That is why I say that for all my respect for Curtin uh, and uh, for uh, his very great uh, achievement in the West Australian field and more particularly, of course, in, in, in the national field, uh, he was extremely fortunate that he returned to Parliament uh, at a time when there was this uh, uh, search for uh, a new leader. If the result of the 1940 election was a lucky one for Curtin, overall it had been a good one for Labour. The Menzies coalition could only govern with the support of two independents. A month later, Curtin's plan for an all-party advisory war council was accepted by Menzies. Prime Minister Menzies presided over a government where not all its members supported him. On the 29th of August, Menzies was replaced as Prime Minister by country party leader Arthur Fadden. Fadden was to remain as Prime Minister only until October the 3rd. The two independents in the House of Representatives, A.W. Coles, the member for Henty in Victoria, and Alexander Wilson, the member for Wimmera, also a Victorian seat, voted with Labour that the Fadden budget be reduced by one pound. This meant the House had no confidence in the government. The government lost the vote by 36 votes to 33. John Curtin became Prime Minister. I remember the episode very vividly because I was teaching at a school in Melbourne at the time and of course I knew Coles as uh, Coles Stores. He was Arthur Coles from Coles Stores. It seemed odd 
that such a successful capitalist should bring down a capitalist government and, re and, and really lead to the formation of a Labour government. But I rather gather that Coles and Wilson too, of course Wilson's an old-fashioned populist section of the country party. He's an independent, I know, but he was, has been influenced by old-fashioned country party populism, which is a party radical, of course. But both of them had come to the conclusion that these people in charge of the Conservative government, Menzies and Fadden and so on, just couldn't win the war for Australia. That they're also convinced that the Japan Japanese were coming into the war and that Australia needed a nationalist government. John Curtin, the son of an Irish immigrant police constable, sometimes known as Hellfire Jack, had come a long way from the goldfields to the launch. John Curtin was going to need a lot more luck as the war clouds darkened and for the first time the Australian nation would face the awesome possibility of an air attack and invasion. Curtin had to ensure that we had modern, well-equipped armed services and that these and other Allied forces which were going to be called upon to help Australia survive were supported by every possible manpower source available in the nation. If John Curtin had weaknesses during his life, they disappeared. He became a model of strength, example and purpose to every Australian. Curtin realised Australia's troops in the Middle East had to return home or to be in a forward Pacific area where Australia's protection was paramount. This was to bring Curtin for the first time into conflict with Britain's wartime leader, Winston Churchill. Rarely were they to agree, but their respect and admiration for one another was to grow enormously. It now seemed inevitable that Japan would enter the war. The most contentious issue with Curtin was the number of crack Australian troops in North Africa. Curtin's predecessor, Fadden, had fought hard with Churchill to have the 9th Division relieved from its Middle East duties, particularly those of holding Tobruk. Curtin backed Fadden's request. He also wanted the 6th and 7th Divisions to return. Australia had its 8th Division stationed at Singapore. On the 4th of December 1941, Curtin left Canberra on his way home to Cottesloe for Christmas. He stopped in Melbourne for a war cabinet meeting on Friday, December the 5th. Booked that evening to leave Melbourne for Adelaide by train, he was delayed by a shower of rain. As Curtin waited for the weather to abate, Frederick Shedden, secretary to cabinet, called him aside and showed him a cable. The cable said a Japanese expedition was on the move. Curtin immediately cancelled his departure from Melbourne and called a press conference for nine o'clock that night in the Victoria Coffee Palace where he was staying. A meeting of the War Advisory Council had been called immediately following dinner. Curtin decided he would stay in Melbourne. Within 48 hours, Japan had attacked Pearl Harbor and Singapore. On December the 8th, Curtin broadcast to the nation Men and women of Australia, we are at war with Japan. That has happened because in the first instance, Japanese naval and air forces launched an unprovoked attack on British and United States territory. Because our vital interests are imperiled and because the rights of free people in the whole Pacific are assailed. Australia now faced its gravest moment in history. There were no longer Australians who felt the war couldn't affect them or that it would go away. Those who may have been complacent were jolted into the reality of the situation. On the 25th of December, Christmas Day, the Japanese had taken Hong Kong. Curtin was concerned during the remaining days of 1941 of the likely further gains by the Japanese. He could not envisage Britain being able to fight a war on two oceans. He was worried about the dangerous unreality of Churchill's promises to give aid to Australia and New Zealand if it was required, or if either country was attacked. Of vital concern to Curtin was that Australia had no direct lines of communication to the United States.
The problems appeared to surface to explosive proportions when Curtin wrote an article in the Melbourne Herald on the 26th of December 1941, part of which read, Without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear that Australia looks to America free of any pains as to our traditional links of kinship with the United Kingdom. If relations had been strained between Curtin and Churchill, they deteriorated dramatically when Churchill read cables flashed around the world of the story. It's always been clear to me that in the same way as both of them were regarded as people whose uh, total experience of life and talents was almost uh, uh, destined for what in both their cases turned out to be their finest hour their saving of their respective countries. Both of them were very conscious of the fact that uh, they were uh, in full or major responsibility for the leadership of their countries in time of crisis. And uh, this uh, obviously explains why Churchill was so determined to defeat Hitler first and why Curtin was so insistent on bringing back our troops from the Middle East and diverting them from Burma to go to Papua New Guinea. While these events were taking place, Curtin was being kept informed 24 hours a day on the seriousness of the war. He had a very, very powerful sense of, uh, of duty, so to speak. Particularly, he was a, very, he was a passionate Australian. You know? And uh, I think this uh, involvement in, uh, in uh, the you know, safety and the future of Australia was of a very powerful motivating force in him and as a result of that he worked himself you know, really tremendously hard. He never made it home to Cottesloe for Christmas in 1941 to see his family. The desperate loneliness he would experience was beginning to surface. His wife Elsie would not come to Canberra to live with him. Many reasons have been put forward. One was Mrs. Curtin never quite saw her role as the wife of an important public figure like the Prime Minister. Her mother lived with her and she saw it as a duty to look after her mother, her family and their home in Cottesloe. Well, I think um, that was her makeup. Uh, like there are some girls that never want to leave their mother or they want to be married, they want to have the better of both worlds. They want their husband, and yet they still want mummy. She wanted to stay at home and be with the children and things like that. She knew that Uncle John loved her. So as far as that was concerned, the love was always there. So she didn't have any doubt in that. The Curtin son, John, had joined the Air Force. Their daughter, Elsie, was concerned for her father, and she journeyed, whenever possible, to Canberra to be with him. January of 1942 was a very hard month for Curtin. The Japanese forces were successfully moving down the Malay Peninsula. The war of words, cables and telegrams between Curtin and Churchill were hotting up. And whatever relationships between them may have existed to this stage, it was deteriorating rapidly. Curtin was warning that Singapore would fall to the Japanese because of its inadequate defenses. Rabaul was under attack and this would mean Port Moresby was in acute danger. Singapore fell on February the 15th, 1942. On the 1st of March, 1942, General Blamey was ordered home from the Middle East. The 6th and 7th Divisions were on their way back from the Middle East. And although Curtin had to do a trade-off with Churchill by leaving the 9th Division there, he intended that it also should return as soon as possible. While the 6th and 7th Divisions were returning, Churchill still tried to have them diverted to Rangoon to save the Burma Road. Curtin stood firm against this, and after much personal anguish, eventually won the day. On the 14th of March, 1942, John Curtin became the first Australian Prime Minister to broadcast to the people of the United States of America. The Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Australia, Mr. John Curtin. Men and women of the United States, I speak to you from Australia. I speak from a united people to a united people. On the great waters of the Pacific Ocean, 
War now breathes its bloody steam. From the skies of the Pacific pours down a deathly hail. In the countless islands of the Pacific, the tide of war flows madly. For you in America, for us in Australia, it is flowing badly. And realising very swiftly that it would be the case, the Australian government saw the full and proper recognition of the part the Pacific was playing in the general strategic disposition of the world's warring forces. It was therefore but natural that within 20 days after Japan's first treacherous blow, I said on behalf of the Australian government that we look to America as the paramount factor on the democracy side in the Pacific. Australia is the last bastion between the west coast of America and the Japanese. If Australia goes, the Americas are wide open. I give you the pledge of my country. There will always be an Australian government and there will always be an Australian people. We are too strong in our hearts. Our spirit is too high. The justice of our cause throbs too deeply in our being for that high purpose to be overcome. Blamey had flown from Cairo to Johannesburg then joined the train to Cape Town. At Cape Town, he joined the Queen Mary. On board were 22,000 American troops bound for Australia. But one night we had finished dinner and we all would go to the, the uh, main lounge in the Queen Mary and there would probably be up to 600 American officers in that lounge for the purpose of a a rehash of the news, and American did it extremely well, as though it were a real, picking up a real broadcast. And this particular evening, there was a message. The fellow said, flash, flash. General MacArthur has been appointed commander-in-chief in the Southwest Pacific area. Now, to a man, those 600 officers rose. You've never heard, heard cheers like it. Of course, our little party in the corner, we stood and applauded and entered into the spirit of it. I said to the general, when he got up to his cabin, I said, what do you think of that appointment of General MacArthur, sir? He said, Norman, I think it's an excellent appointment. Oh, I said, do you know General MacArthur's? Oh, he said, knew, I knew his background, of course. I asked him then, why? He said, well, he'll be so far away from his own government, he will not have any interference. As far as our own government is concerned, he will not take any notice. Blamey and Curtin formed a very close bond and deep mutual trust and confidence for one another. However, among other members of the cabinet, there was a hostility to Blamey. His appointment had clearly been that of Curtin alone. Curtin and his cabinet were tremendously impressed with MacArthur. His arrival in Australia at Roosevelt's command was a great Australian morale builder. Amy had an incredible military task ahead of him. He virtually had two Australian armies, the Australian Imperial Forces and the Australian Military Forces. The AMF, being conscripts, were not allowed outside Australian territory. They were ill-equipped and badly trained. On the other hand, Australia had the embarrassment of American conscripts being brought to Australia to fight for Australia. And yet some Australians wouldn't go outside their own territory to fight for their own country. A significant turning point in the Pacific War came when Curtin announced in federal parliament on Friday afternoon, the 7th of May, the commencement of the historic Coral Sea battle. He was very worried about the Japanese invasion and he, there were so many sleepless, no, sleepless nights prior to the Coral Sea battle, which apparently affected his health immensely. Following this victory came the Midway Island Sea Battle early in June. Again, 
the Allies were successful. But drama was to strike close to home. On June the 17th, four midget Japanese submarines had penetrated Sydney Harbour. They were detected and destroyed. However, war was now very close to urban Australia. 1942 was a very austere year for Australia. Prime Minister John Curtin, if in Melbourne at a weekend, would take time out to see Fitzroy play. His nephew, Claude Curtin, was an up-and-coming star full forward with Fitzroy. Claude was a very good player in my book. He's one of our best forwards. He was a splendid mark and a very fine field player, but he's, uh, he doesn't mind me saying this, I'm sure, but he was a bit inaccurate with his kicking for goals. He was a good long kick, but it used to be wobbly and not as direct like the other full forwards of the day. I was getting um, halfway through the last quarter, actually, and I'd kick five goals, and we'd got within a few points of uh, Richmond. We'd been trailing all day. So the ball comes down to our half forward line and I move out and uh, hoping that my friend who had the ball would see me and kick it to me. But I didn't notice this fellow run down the ground. And while I was running out to make position, this fellow made the position for me and went right through me. He happened to be Jack Dyer, well known as Captain Blood. And uh, I don't remember much about the game after that. Anyhow, he did what he wanted to do because Richmond won the game. And whilst that was going on, John Curtin was in the outer and had to be forcibly restrained from jumping the fence. Oh, well, I suppose football's football. You're out there to win a game. I should have been looking anyway. He attended to the Prime Minister's nephew. Curtin had been Prime Minister 12 months. He had grown in stature among the Australian people. What was not generally known is that Curtin was experiencing some problems from within his own ranks, particularly from Ward and the frustrated backbencher, Arthur Colwell. By the end of the year, and because of patient negotiation through President Roosevelt, Curtin was able to have the 9th Australian Division return to Australia from the Middle East. It would take Curtin from November 1942 to February 1943 to convince the Labour movement and his party colleagues to let the AMF fight outside Australia. I met John Curtin in the corridor one day and he said, Reg, uh, come in and have a yarn. Sit down, have a cigarette. And he told me what he proposed to do. He pointed out that his trouble very largely was that American troops were conscripts. They were giving their lives to fight for the integrity and the future of Australia as well, of course, as America itself. And he said his position was an invidious one. And under those circumstances, although he had strenuously opposed conscription in World War I, he now proposed to extend this area to some distance north of Australia. I listened attentively to him, never interrupted. And then I said to him, well, Jack, I appreciate and understand your position very well indeed. But my position is somewhat different. I voted against conscription in World War I, although I served in World War I. I determined that never again would I compel any other man to do those things in war which I undertook to do voluntarily. He uh, listened attentively. He then took me by the arm led me to the door, green door, uh, that uh, goes out of the Prime Minister's room. And as I went out, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Reg, you might be right. Well, that melted me and uh, eventually, accepting the party's decision, I cast a vote, you know, in favour of the alteration. On February the 19th, 1943, the bill passed through Parliament and became law. His most embarrassing minister, Eddie Ward, was to raise another controversial issue, that of the Brisbane Line. It was alleged to be a plan endorsed by the previous Menzies Fadden government to abandon Northern Australia in the event of a Japanese invasion. Some of the servicemen um, had their contingent plans. They weren't um, plans in the sense of preparations uh, next day. 
but they were planned for what might happen in the day after. And Ward um, couldn't see it like that. The opposition counterclaimed that the Curtin government was in power when the Japanese came into the war, so that if there was a Brisbane line, it was one agreed to by Curtin. Then Ward again caused outrage by claiming that an important report on the issue was missing from official files on the matter and that the report was known to General MacArthur. This resulted in a royal commission into allegations concerning the so-called missing file. The findings of the royal commission were never completed because Ward claimed parliamentary privilege and would not appear before the commission. This resulted in a demand by the opposition for an election. They promised to block supply in the Senate where they held a majority unless Curtin agreed. Election was held on August the 1st. Curtin won resoundingly with majorities in both houses. 1943 had considerably drained Curtin. He was desperately lonely without his family in Canberra. She stayed away from um, Canberra, partly because she didn't like the place, and partly because she had her own family to look after. I don't think at any stage there was any criticism from Curtin about that. By September 1943, the Japanese advance had been halted at Milton Bay. However, the Japanese landing at Buna had developed into a strong thrust into the Owen Stanley range with Port Moresby as its objective. Army Minister Ford and the Advisory War Council wanted Blamey to go to Moresby to ensure the defences there were secure. General MacArthur seemed unwilling to praise or trust the Australian forces or recognise the very important role they were playing. Blamey flew to Port Moresby to see his commanding officer, Lieutenant General Rowell. Rowell refused to cooperate with Blamey. So, uh, a signal was sent to Mr Curtin that stayed in the position and suggesting or advising the Prime Minister that Rao was, would be relieved of his command. This created a furore for the Australian War Advisory Council and Army Minister Ford. However, Blamey had the full support and loyalty of Curtin. Blamey stayed in New Guinea until Rowell had been replaced and the Japanese had been pushed back and forced to retreat on the Kokoda Trail. The 8th of January 1944 would be Curtin's 59th birthday. He had decided to return to Perth to celebrate this event and Christmas with his family. After his holiday in Perth, Curtin returned to Canberra early in 1944. He was soon again throwing himself into his work. But it was beginning to take its toll and his health appeared to be deteriorating. His complete loneliness wasn't helping him. He missed his wife, Elsie, and his family. He did um, long for her without judging her, without complaining because of his uh, loneliness. He held an incredible number of press conferences, many believed because of his loneliness. I think that uh, um, all of the, the circumstances that uh, lead people to strive also tend to cause them to be lonely. I think it would be true to say that most people at the top are to an extent lonely. His visits to Washington and London went well. Roosevelt and Churchill were impressed with Curtin. His sincerity and ability to express himself and Australia's viewpoint both clearly and eloquently. He was given the freedom of the City of London. However, while in London, he declined most invitations. He preferred to stay in his hotel room or to go for walks around Hyde Park. This was possibly the first sign that John Curtin's health was beginning to fail. There were times when I felt that he, he did, he, he looked and sounded terribly tired, you know. The way he had, uh, e e you know, all the things that he had to do became, were an e had become an effort. One invitation he did accept was to Magdalen College, Cambridge University, to accept an honorary doctorate at the Bloors. 
When Curtin returned to Australia, a referendum was about to get underway which would give the Commonwealth more national powers. Curtin only spoke at two meetings in favour of the referendum and then announced that he would not be well enough to take any further part. The referendum was lost. Curtin felt the very people, the workers he represented, and should be able to rely on were letting him down. The industrial unrest was worrying him and contributing to his failing health. 1944 had seen the Prime Minister age considerably. He had been to the United States and England. He had lost a referendum, been through a trying session of Parliament and presided over his war cabinet. He was travelling from Perth to Canberra by train early in November. His wife Elsie and daughter were staying in Perth to attend young John Curtin's forthcoming wedding. On arriving in Melbourne, he suffered a serious heart attack was taken to the Mercy Hospital. What seems amazing is that his wife did not leave everything in Perth to come to be with her husband. He was very seriously ill. Their son's wedding was important, but the family could have been represented by their daughter or the wedding postponed. In the first three weeks of hospitalization, Curtin was allowed visits only by relatives and close friends. General Blamey visited him twice James Scullin saw him, as did Arthur Colwell, and Archbishop Mannix came to see him twice. Curtin spent Christmas of 1944 in the Mercy Hospital, and still his wife, Elsie, would not come. He was a very lonely man. The Curtin family deny that there was any anti-Catholic feeling by Mrs. Curtin. However, it is unexplained why she did not visit her husband at the Mercy Hospital. She had very strong and anti-Catholic views. Uh, it never entered, as far as I know, into her um, uh, deliberations with him about political issues. But, um, and she would, if she didn't go for those reasons, it wasn't because um, she was worried about the effect it might have on Curtin. She was worried about the, um, whether well, there would be inconsistency with her views and with going along. Was it because the Mercy was a Catholic hospital? Was it that Archbishop Mannix had tried to have Curtin return to Catholicism? The Catholic zealot did raise the matter of returning to the church with Curtin. Archbishop Mannix told friends later that Curtin declined the invitation to return to Catholicism. There may well have been a very serious marital rift it is unusual in the extreme that a wife who loved her husband would not want to be at his bedside if he was seriously ill from a massive heart attack and at death's doorstep. It would seem to matter little who ran the hospital. It is also significant that Elsie Curtin and her family would not take up permanent residence with her husband at the lodge. It was only in the days and hours leading up to his death that Elsie Curtin stayed at the lodge with her husband. When John Curtin left the Mercy Hospital early in January of 1945, it was his daughter who journeyed to Melbourne to go to Canberra with her father. She stayed with him for a few weeks at the lodge and again returned to Perth. John Curtin wrote his daughter a very moving letter, thanking her for staying with him for a few weeks at the lodge. The letter was that of a desperately sick and lonely man. On January the 19th, 1945, the acting Prime Minister, Frank Ford, announced that Curtin would be returning to his duties in three days' time. By February, he was again making his traditionally brilliant parliamentary speeches. But this time, they were draining vital energies from him that he needed to keep going. During April, Curtin's attendances at Parliament and War Cabinet were becoming irregular because of his ill health. On the 8th of April, he left a sickbed to make a moving speech to Parliament on the death of President Roosevelt. Days later, he was back in hospital, suffering from congestion of the lungs. He needed her desperately. Still, she would not come. On the 8th of May, the war came to an end in Europe. It now meant that all the concentration of the Allies would be on finishing the war with Japan. John Curtin's time 
drawing near. What had been his real contribution? How would Australians remember him? The man uh, who uh, did so much uh, to ensure a united effort uh, in the critical period uh, of the war years. Both Curtin and Chifley uh, suffered severely from the fact that neither could command uh, the presence uh, at his side uh, of a wife who uh, accepted the, uh, the social life and the obligations uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of Canberra's political uh, uh, existence, and, and to that extent uh, softened the strain uh, which a prime minister has uh, got to bear. Would they ever realize his desperate loneliness? There seemed little time left for this man to reflect and question. Had his personal sacrifices been worth it? Curtin had too much to do. Too, the responsibilities were enormous. Should he have allowed himself to renounce his personal life and devote it to the austerity he saw as necessary to arrive at the leadership qualities and respect needed to do his job as prime minister in his country's darkest hours? What were John Curtin's conflicts towards the end? Religion and loneliness seemed to be with him in the closing months of his life. Prime Minister John Curtin's two surviving children, Elsie and John, declined to pay a tribute to their father in this program. Their father has been dead now for over 40 years. However, his daughter Elsie was always willing to assist with official information and records concerning her father. In his final days, John Curtin's wife Elsie came to be at the lodge with her husband. He called one of his ministers and friend, Norman Makin, to the lodge the night before he died. Do you think that they would allow Hector Har the Reverend Hector Harrison to go across uh, to Perth to bury me? Oh, I said, I'm sure that there would be no objection to that. Oh, no, I said, do you? But anyhow, he gave me a second name of someone in Perth. And uh, then after a, a few words of conversation, I, I told him, I said, you know, I said, you've always been a very gracious man to me. And whenever I said the uh, situations have arisen and difficulties have, uh, have come, I said, you've always left me and finally said to me, well, God bless you. And I say now to you, John, God bless you. He had a late night cup of tea with his wife shortly before midnight. Then he said, smilingly, go on, Mrs. Curtin. It's best that you go off to bed now. She went to an adjoining room, but did not sleep, and was with him when he died without waking. John Curtin died at 4 a.m. on July the 5th, 1945. Also at the lodge when he died was his son, RAAF Sergeant John Curtin. Curtin was to be denied the opportunity to share in the victory over Japan two months later on September the 2nd. A victory he had worked so hard and long for, and ultimately paid the full price for with his life. On Saturday, July the 7th, 1945, the body of John Curtin lay in state, draped in the Australian blue ensign flag in King's Hall Parliament House. A memorial service was conducted by the Reverend Hector Harrison. It was broadcast nationally at 2 p.m. The body was then flown to Western Australia for a state funeral on the Sunday. John Curtin's body was borne on a motorized gun carriage to Karakata Cemetery. The casket again draped in the Australian blue ensign. It seemed as if every citizen in Perth lined the route of the funeral. Never had so many notable Commonwealth and international representatives ever attended the funeral of one man in West Australia.
the uh, debt that is owed by to John Curtin is enormous. He saved this country in the time of its greatest crisis uh, when he assumed the Prime Ministership in 1941. And uh, he was able by his force of personality to world Australians of various backgrounds and commitments together in the cause of the salvation of Australia. Curtin, you can see, was a man of vision. He was a man of courage. He was articulate. He had the capacity to ask people and groups of people to see beyond their own limited self-interests and indeed to put those self-interests in the wider vision of, uh, of their country's interests. I regard uh, John Curtin as a very great Australian, as the greatest of our Prime Ministers,